Okay, continuing on with uh, Chapter 6, Part 2, we're right in the middle of the French and Indian War. On a larger scale, this is the Seven Years' War that's being fought globally between the English and their American colonies and their Indian allies, the Iroquois, against the French and their Indian allies, the Huron. Now, the French, uh, I'm sorry, the British general, uh, uh, Braddock, is already dead. William Pitt, who was the uh, great, known as the Great Commoner, he was the Prime Minister of Great Britain at this time, he really took a, a huge interest in what was going on in North America. Obviously, his goal as the Prime Minister of Great Britain is to defeat the French because they are his enemy, obviously. Um, his major focus is on achieving the French West Indies and conquering uh, Quebec and Montreal because these are really the only uh, two settlements in what is today Canada that they can conquer because New France is way too spread out. There's no way to conquer all of it. So he really focuses attention on taking Quebec and Montreal and also the French West Indies. Um, by refocusing this attention, Quebec eventually surrendered in 1759. Montreal soon fell right after there in 1760. And with this, um, France was essentially removed from North America. They were defeated in the French and Indian War. And there was some stuff going on in Europe as well at this time that uh, caused them to lose this war, which obviously you have to read about in the pageant. Um, but with this, we see the Treaty of Paris is the treaty that ends this war. Now, this is going to be Treaty of Paris Part 1. There's going to be a thousand other Treaty of Parises to come in the future. Um, and in this treaty, France basically gave their Spanish ally uh, Louisiana and Mississippi. Now, America will get this back eventually, so don't worry about that. But in the Treaty of Paris that ended the Seven Years' War, Spain for a little while uh, achieved Louisiana and the Mississippi Territory, or I should say no, uh, the northern portion of this. Uh, Great Britain received the northern portion of Florida in exchange for uh, Cuba. And finally, uh, Great Britain remained the dominant world and naval power. That's really what Great Britain got out of this. They are the number one superpower of the world at this time. Spain is not in the mix anymore. France is not in the mix anymore. Great Britain is number one. Here you see this is an artist's rendering of the capture of Quebec in 1759, you know, with a huge British fleet uh, coming into port. Uh, here you see some of the major skirmishes in this war uh, along uh, the northern part of what is today America. Now, the results of the French and Indian War. This is a pretty minor war on a global scale. But for Americans living here in America, obviously, it has a huge effect on our uh, uh, ancestors. Um, First and foremost, we gained military confidence from our victory. Americans had fought alongside the British and had gained this military confidence. They had been successful in a lot of battles, but obviously not invincible. Also, and most importantly, they gained a lot of experience and officers. And like I'd said earlier, this really is the training ground for the French or for the revolution that is to come. Many of our generals and our soldiers in the American Revolution came out of the French and Indian War. Another major result of the French and Indian War is we start to see this clash between the British and the Americans. We're, the Americans are not viewed as Englishmen living in America. They are viewed as colonial amateurs by many of the British officers. They look down their noses at them, which only sought to create more conflict between the British and the Americans here. Uh, for example, many uh, British soldiers would not recognize a colonial officer higher than the post of captain, which really angered many of the Americans uh, that fought in this war. They wanted more recognition for the role that they played in this, especially since now Great Britain uh, has this huge empire, thanks in part to the American colonists who helped uh, defeat the French. Um, also, there was animosity be between the Americans and the British simply because many American shippers continued to trade with the enemy uh, during the war. Obviously, trading with the enemy is illegal. It, it's aiding the enemy. Uh, and for the last year, uh, the British really had to patrol New England particularly to ensure that no exports were going out of uh, the American colonies because many of them were going to the French West Indies, which only prolonged the war in the face of the British. 
and very important for the Americans. And while it's not 100% there yet, many roads were made to fix the colonial disunity that was going on. Remember, America was created by many different types of people for many different reasons. It wasn't an automatic thing that they were going to band together when the American Revolution comes. This is step one to creating some colonial unity. There's still a long way to go before the American Revolution can happen. So with the removal of the French from North America, Americans had this new sense of independence that they could really stretch out. Remember, our population was still doubling every 25 years. We needed more land to grow. And so the Americans now, without the French involved, felt that they could really expand westward. Um, and they wanted to create new Indian policies simply because pr prior to this, uh, Native Americans were able to play the different European superpowers off one another. If the British wouldn't give them a good deal, then they could get a, a better deal possibly from the French. There's no longer that opportunity anymore because the British are the only ones that they can deal with anymore. Uh, they have to deal exclusively with the British and the Americans. So as Americans started to move further west, though, they faced a problem in 1763. And this is very important. It's a favorite AP test question. Uh, an Ottawa ch Ottawan chief, uh, Pontiac, actually launched a rebellion against uh, the Americans moving westward, and in part with some of the Frenchmen who were left behind uh, as they tried to move into the Ohio Valley. Uh, they killed 2,000 American settlers moving into the Ohio Valley. They really wanted to keep uh, American colonization from pushing further and further westward. Uh, the British and the Americans responded by sending blankets to the Ottawans um, that were tainted with smallpox in order to end this rebellion. But the problem with the Pontiac's Rebellion is it shows that even though the French are technically gone from North America, the British are going to have to protect their American colonists should they want to continue moving further westward. The British have just, have just fought a very expensive war. They have a lot of debt that they have to pay off. And they're not necessarily willing to pay for further protection of the Americans if they want to move into the Ohio Valley. So in 1763, in direct correlation with Pontiac's Rebellion, Great Britain issues the Proclamation of 1763. This is a line of demarcation where they basically ban all American colonists from moving beyond the Appalachian uh, Mountains before they deal with the American, or I'm sorry, with the Native Americans. Uh, many colonists angry over this proclamation line, feeling it was their God-given right to move westward, disregarded Parliament's order and moved into the Ohio Valley uh, anyway. Um, here you could see once again where the, the British colonies were, where the French colonies were, and where the Spanish colonies were before 1754, obviously before the French and Indian War. And then after 1763, not only has um, Great Britain achieved a large empire by capturing uh, Canada and having control over this, but you could also see where that proclamation line of 1763 is, which only sought to create further tension between the Americans and uh, the British government. And that is it for Chapter 6.